<laughs> you're good. My good man. You're good. You're good. No, I just walked in. I just got everything on, on the machine. Okay. Right. So here she said, this is Greg Bell. Greg Bell. Greg Bell. Hi, Jeff. Nice to meet you. He came up from uh, UA Tuscaloosa. Awesome. I was there yesterday. <laughs> Working. Yes. Yeah. Good to take a trip. I know. <laughs> Good coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to be recording this thing. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just do your reading and do mine. There you go. go. There you go. <laughs> I was telling Ryan that I, I see these emails every week, and I'm like, every time I take a uh, Maybe I'll get this first from behind me and show it. It proves I can do it. You know, you know we'll be a little bar here. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, this is you know, it's that first. It's like, you know, it's like working out. You know, you have, first, you have to find your shoes. And you have to put them on the next day. Then you have to find the gym next. And, you know, maybe a month later. That, that kind of feels like what could build the philosophy around that statement. You know, yeah. first, I'm working yeah. to find your shoes. It's the first yeah. I was listening to this, uh, this basketball coach on a, on a podcast, and he said that he would always give people the same piece of advice that he heard his sister give for yoga students. He said, just say, just mind your mat. <laughs> That's right, mind your mat. Yeah, I hear you. Is that your mat? No, mind your mat. That's right. All that matters is what's on your mat. Exactly. Hopefully you. Yeah, 
She's a nurse. Yeah, he did. He wanted her to be. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a nurse. She's a nurse. She's a nurse.
we, we, we've, uh, we've called our presentation sort of taking a risk, which actually stands for Research and Informatics Service Center, which is something that we built together after working together for several years. And we also thought it was funny because it was two young guys who really didn't know what they were doing, taking a huge risk that they were probably going to lose their jobs and they couldn't pull this off and not really knowing what they were doing. So it really, you know, we built up this outcomes unit and we had a multiple disciplines working together with it. And, um, you know, amazingly, we've, uh, we've kept it going now for several years and have really created a platform that I think enables a lot of things to happen. So I think what we want to tell you is sort of how we went about things. And um, these slides, I think, maybe reflect a lot of things that went well. But I assure you, we learned from our mistakes and we probably could have about two or three hundred slides on mistakes and sort of things that we took away. But I think these are what we think is distilled into a little bit of our thought process, how we got to from being two independent investigators to sort of see, OK, how can we build something that's bigger than both of us and how do we sustain it over time? So those are the beats, and along it, you'll kind of hear a couple of things that um, we think are important to share with you as you think about your journey. So this is, you know, collaboration is a career path, you know, the building of a sustainable platform, the centrality of educational and professional education, and then why should you start with why? So I guess we, you know, we, we talked about how to begin the story. We wanted to begin the story maybe telling you the story of the 1917 clinic and how this HIV clinic in Alabama in the mid-80s with less than 50 patients becomes a national contributor to several types of research. And the bones of this story are some clever fundamental things that the people involved, its founder Mike Sag and several other folks, did with data. And this is the 1970 clinic in 1988. Remember that in 1988, there's nothing you can do about HIV, pretty much. There is no successful therapy. HIV is a death sentence. A lot of the, a lot of the things that we're applying in HIV, we're taking from the literature for how do you communicate about lethal genetic diseases. This is what's informing the conversations about HIV in terms of here's your diagnosis, here's your prognosis. But the clinic... Um, begins to collect basic demographic information from the people that are there, some therapeutic information, things that we're trying that weren't, weren't working out, the HIV clinical events, the opportunistic infections as defined by the CDC, and some quick laboratory stuff where we use that. And then Mike Sag did something very interesting. He also had a refrigerator full of samples, of blood samples. And he said, wouldn't it be neat if I had a common identifier that tied in to all the stuff in the refrigerator and tied in to this clinical information that I have. And then all of a sudden he would get phone calls and people would say, Mike Sag, I have heard that you perhaps may have one or two samples with people with this opportunistic infection who have these lab values. And he would put in the line of code and say, no, I don't have two, I have 35. And people's eyes would light up and they say, may we collaborate? So the 1917 clinic becomes a real feeding, it just a, this, this sample pipeline for all this early work on pathogenesis, concepts that we take for granted in HIV, like the viral load is important. How many copies of the virus sort of has something to say about how fast the disease is progressing? A lot of that early work is informed from samples and, and data that comes from the clinic. The relationship in early HIV pathogenesis, and the clinic goes along for many years, and then they kind of come back to the well and they say, we think we should collect more data because it's looking like we have treatments that might actually work. And this is around 1995. And they get a grant from the Department of Medicine and they basically create a structure where they have an MS access database and they hire a couple of people in medical records. And these people read every note and they take away the diagnoses and the medications and they type them into the MS access database. So they started adding, you can see concurrent treatments comorbidities that people were having, you know, side effects of drugs, uh, uh, different things like that, general laboratories, some socioeconomic variables, and maybe some adherent self-report that were there. All of a sudden, as these data accumulates, the 1970 clinic has a lot to say about other things. It's now perfectly positioned. So when a drug company says, I've got a new agent, and I want to see who's taking it, what's their adherence, are there any side effects, what's the impact on their labs, can you help me with the clinical trial? And he can go... I have 55 people that I could enroll in that clinical trial today. Nobody else has this. It's because he has built the bones and he is capturing the data. It's because his clinical work from the very beginning, something that you almost do, 
as you think about the clinical part of your practice, if that is indeed a part of what you do, or if you don't have that, you have a partner that has a clinical practice. And from the very beginning, you're both thinking about the reuse of the data at the point of capture. So if you spend a little bit of extra time designing how you're going to capture data, how people are going to be seen in the clinic, and what's the output going to look like, you are basically creating the building blocks that are going to fuel your research. And this is what they stumbled upon. And because of this, many of the agents of about the first 15 HIV drugs, many of them were tested in humans for the first time two blocks from here, which is sort of mind boggling because we were far, far from the epicenter of the epidemic in those days. And yet we were an incredible voice in that time for, for pushing HIV research forward. The clinic continues to grow. And now in 1999, something happens in the health system, which was interesting they get scheduling software. And this scheduling software tells you who's got a visit, where do they have to be, at what time, and it reports whether they showed up or they didn't show up, or if they canceled that visit. A very innocuous piece of data that would sit there for about five years before somebody figured out, foreshadowing, <laughs> what to do with that piece of data. But it was added, and no one knew what to do with it, but it added to this. This is kind of what things looked like for us during that time. These were our paper charts, you can imagine. But again, we had people that would you know, go through this morass <coughs> and lift some key elements and put it in an electronic database that we could search through. I might, I might just jump in, because this is, for me, this is when I was first here as a resident. So I finished medical school in 1999, came to UAB, spent four years here, and this is what it looked like. I spent a month doing research in the basement, it's a scary basement. There were rodents. <laughs> there were mouse traps. <laughs> really there were mouse traps everywhere. Oh, okay. But with paper charts doing this kind of work, and at the time, Ray Chen was an ID fellow, and Ray Chen was preceded by Stephanie Call. So Mike Sag had this great vision. I think created this, you know, database with this repository, linked them up, and then relied upon a Stephanie Call as a fellow. She did a Gen Med fellowship. <coughs> Ray Chen as an ID fellow to come in and ask some questions in the health services outcome space. So moving from the translational um, side to the health services outcome space, Ashley Chatham was our one data analyst. So she did all the data queries, not just for research, but for the entire clinic for clinical reporting. Andy Westfall, statistician, still working with us all these years later. Jim Raper, the clinic director, a nurse practitioner, a, a jack of all trades. I mean, this wonderful research mind who as a director of the clinic saw that research and clinical care go hand in hand and make each other better. And I, these two guys, Jerome Carter and Ashwin Villar, were over in their own office and they were doing some sort of programming and informatics work. And I really didn't fully understand it and appreciate it. And at this point, I leave to go do fellowship and I think it's kind of when you enter. So this is kind of the landscape when I'm here four years, do a few projects, see these charts. These two guys on the bottom are building this electronic health record, but I don't really quite get it. And then I'm gone for three years and I go do a fellowship at, at Duke. So here's when I get to UAB. At this time, these guys have succeeded in saying the institution went to Horizon, which was an electronic medical record where you would dictate in notes. Mike Sag knew enough about discrete data that he said, I will not be having my providers dictate notes. I want them to enter discrete data in terms of diagnoses and medications. This was an outrageous thing to say. The university had 95% adoption. There were two clinical units who refused to use uh, Horizon. One of them was the HIV clinic. And what was put in front of him was, if you will not do this, then and if you want to build your own thing, you have to figure out a way to get your notes into our system. That's that, or you can't have your own system. And Mike Sag, if you ever met him, he's like, the, he's like there, dad. he's like a man without fear. And he's like, yeah, I can figure out how to do that. He couldn't even spell those words. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll figure this out. We'll find a way to do it. And I always look at him like, do you, do you have a pulse? <laughs> but yeah, he was like, yeah, we'll figure that out. And they had. And in 2004, I come in, and you can see that it's the same data capture, but now we've gone from what's called an interval cohort, where you come and you have your visits periodically, and somebody sort of tra you know, lifts the data. There's the swivel chair database. They look at it in this in your paper, then they swivel their chair, and then they type it into your database over here. They go from that type of model to saying all clinicians in the front line have to put in their medication data if they want to print out a prescription, and they have to put in their diagnosis data so that we can generate bills and we can do our work. So every clinician was angry that they had to do this, and we probably still are to this day. 
but that gave people discrete data. These were our notes, you know, when I got here. This was a note. This is a note from 2000. Dr. Raper signed it. Though you can read some words, Dr. Gepford co-signed it. They're both here. I have shown this to them over the years. None of them can read this note to me. Um, not the full thing. You can pick up scattered words, but this was the HIV collection of data. This is what it turned into with this electronic health record. And I was lucky enough when I came in that I always say that I was always already a veteran of three transitions to an EHR when I came here. And when everybody, and I was hearing the same complaints now for the fourth time, and I completely ignored this world. And from the very beginning, I became the first provider to do 100% adoption of the CHR, which meant that I was accruing experience much faster than anybody else. And I realized that the, that the uh, programmers were on the first floor. So I would go downstairs and I would say, hey, let me tell you a way that you can make my job easier and save me like three clicks every time I prescribe a medicine. And they would hear me out and we'd draw on the whiteboard and they'd say, okay, we'll do that. And eventually the, the thing kept getting more improved until SAG sort of came to them and says, well, how is this getting better? Because Jerome Carter had left. So there was no, there was no physician that worked with him. And he says, how are you guys making this better? He said, well, there's a little weird guy who keeps coming down the back stairs. And he comes in here and he tells us what to do. So we've been doing it for about six months and I think it's going well. So he, so he, then, so he then figured out who I was and I had to sit across the table from him thinking he was really angry at me. And he basically ends the conversation with, I want you to come do research with me. <laughs> And so, and so for me, this is, so I come back now, I'm finishing fellowship and Mike wants me to come back and work at UAB and you got to meet this guy, Willig. So the first time I meet Willig, I'm like, you know, this guy's crazy. I love him. I mean, he's, he's got all these great ideas and he's crazy and, he, and he, we talk together and, and he says, you know, SAG really thinks a lot of you. He thinks a good bit of me. So he thinks if we come together, we can do something meaningful. And I give Mike credit for, I think, you know, seeing a potential and opportunity and so when I come back and start working with James, you know, here we are together with these different experiences. I've done a health services, ARP T32 training fellowship. James has also done a T32, spent a lot of time in this informatics space. And we come together and say, here's this platform that was built over a decade ago, and we're barely scratching the surface for health services research. What's happening right now is you've got all these data, all this time, and what happens is a Stephanie Call comes along, a Ray Chen comes along, but this incredible resource is being underutilized. How can we come together with our interests and expertise and take this incredible foundation and make it more available and more usable to generate more knowledge, and to generate more knowledge, not to publish papers and get grants, but to improve how we deliver services and improve people's health and wellness and preventing new HIV infection. So, this is a summary of some of the Willigisms that I've come to admire over the years. Um, so trust but verify. James is, is uh, slow to trust, but if you keep showing up and are honest and earnest, you will gain his trust. I'm probably overly trusting. We complement each other. Uh, hope is not a plan. So if you ever go to James and say, you know, well, what's, you know, what, I don't know, hope, you know, and the hope is not a plan. Uh, process matters. And we'll talk about process matters. So. You know, it's good to have big vision. You need big vision. But if you can't operationalize that vision into a process, it stays in the cloud. So you got to bring it down to the ground, operationalize it, and create processes to make that vision operational and happen. And then another famous willigism is everybody bleeds a little. And, and the, the idea of everybody bleeds a little is typically in academic medicine, it's all about me. My grants, my people, my this, my, my, my. And that if you want to build something bigger, You've got to be willing to say, I got to do my stuff, but I'm willing to give a little bit towards a greater cause and a greater good. And I think from the very beginning kind of came together and said, you know, we both have our interests and our aspirations. But if we're willing to give a little bit of our me time towards a larger cause and effort, maybe we can achieve something more. And, and then kind of came together from the beginning and said, well, here's the plan and the process. And, and a lot of credit to James, I think, articulating and, and the words really matter that this clinical cohort is a platform. It's not a platform for the people in the building or one or two people. It should be a platform for the masses. This is a rich resource. Let's use it. The idea that we've got to brand this. We've done all this great work. We've had all these people come to us. We don't have a name. We're just the, the UAB cohort. So that was, that was we need a name. He brought in this idea of data integrity and data quality he'll talk about. So, you know, if you get garbage data in, you get garbage data out, you could evaluate it. But what you're evaluating in your inferences is, is going to be flawed. So the idea of really thinking about data in the way bankers and credit card companies think about data um, and, and then just very, very simple ideas. So going back to when I was here as a fellow, a resident, 
it was a Friday research meeting. There wasn't an agenda. People would show up. If Mike Sag wasn't in town, we didn't meet. People would sit around the table. Who's got an idea? I don't know. Here's an idea. What's known about that? I don't know. So it was not a very efficient process. I mean, it was, and again, not, not anyone's fault. It was, you know, it, there was goodwill and good spirit, but the idea of let's get an agenda. If no one has an idea, let's not meet. If Mike Sag's not in town, someone has an idea, let's meet. We can't have everything run through one people. And the same is true of James and I. Now we've became the right limiting step and you got to get out of the way. You got to have an engine that isn't relying upon one or two people, but a very simple idea of what's your concept? Simple, one page. What's the question? Give me a paragraph of background. Please give me four or five citations. So don't say, I don't know what's been done. So if I go to PubMed and I go, this is a wonderful question, but guess what? These 30 people have answered it. So the idea, very simple, bring a concept sheet, bring it to a group where you have around the table physicians, nurses, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, behavioral scientists, social workers, this whole cadre of people. Some are research people, some are clinical people. They don't do research, but they're interested. They want to contribute. We're asking clinically important questions. So come together around that concept, make it better, poke holes in it, you know, make it better. And then that moved to, and again, this was never even on my radar coming out of a good, you know, health services research training program was how does that concept go to a data request? So this concept and idea, I need the data. I need James and his team to say, what do you mean by this? What is this element? What time period? So how do you go from this fine tuned concept sheet to a data request that extracts the data and in a really nice data set that Andy Westfall isn't cleaning. Andy Westfall, here's your data. You can go ahead and run analysis. You're writing SAS code. You're not cleaning this, this data set. And then also a ton of credit to James from very early on, we valued having students, medical students, nursing students, public health students. And very early on, James took the initiative to create a student manual and student guide to say, our goal for you is to publish a first author publication. That is our goal, that is our expectation. If that is what you wanna do, it's a lot of work, but I'm gonna give you the guide. I'm gonna give you the blueprint and the steps to achieve that work. And so some of the branding, and again, some of the stuff that we did early on was say, you know, here's our cohort, here's our team, here are the names, here are the faces, here's who we are. So now at the end of our manuscripts, even if people weren't a masthead author, we're gonna acknowledge these people because the research team behind, you know, and the informatics team behind the scenes, it's them that's making all of this work possible, right? You might have an idea as an investigator, you do the writing, but it's these folks on the research and informatics team that are actually doing the lion's share of the work that makes this all possible. So when we give a presentation, here's the closing side. I wanna thank these folks. I want you know this to be front and center. So I think this was part of our transition in the idea of moving from here's this grand vision, how do we now you know, operationalize this and move this forward? And just to go, just a second, we had some great conversations with the data request where people would come in and they would say, so I'm looking for variables because I want to measure happiness. And I'd look at them and I'd say, is that a lab test? Is that a, is that a like, how do I find that in the electronic? Uh, I don't know. I just, can you just extract from that database happiness? I can't extract happiness. Well, what do you, you know, but when you know your database and you can talk to people and say, you know, I don't have quite that, but here's a surrogate. How about we get you this instead? And you know, those conversations all of a sudden become written and we literally sit there and we write this data request. And we can hand something that the programmers understand. And they basically say, ah, oh, you want this variable. So it's all in zeros and ones, and they extract that database. And our statistician, another great inefficiency was, we give a database to our statisticians, they spend three, four weeks just cleaning those data. Now we would sort of spend a lot of time on the front end, going back to where the data were captured, thinking about how can we ensure quality when the data are captured? And then how can we ensure quality when the data are extracted? And then probably our data cleanup burden went down 80 or 90%. Statisticians love to work with us because we were, they would run, a, we would give them a database, they would do certain descriptives and they would say, you have missing data here and here and here, or I saw this pattern. And in two or three conversations, two or three emails, usually four or five days, that database was ready to, you were seeing output by the end of the week. But it was an incredible amount of work thinking back to when every one of us sees a patient, how are we capturing these data? How do we make sure that all of these things fit together downstream? At the very beginning of the design of the clinical endeavor, you're thinking about the reuse of the data. And that's something that needs to be threaded through your entire enterprise. By 2008, you know, we continue to add different data types, patient reported outcomes and resistance data. But now, you know, we've worked for a while. We're thinking about data differently. 
you know, this is how everybody sees the relational database underneath the HR and medical record. This is just a small subsection of it, but you see that in all those lines and it's sort of a little, you know, you sort of catch your breath. But we didn't, we, at this point, we weren't seeing it this way. What we were seeing was this. Each one of those tables is a legal block. And all these investigators were coming to us and they would say, hey, I am a nurse from, you know, um, G, what is it, geology, not geology, old people, gerontology. <laughs> <laughs> I am a nurse from gerontology. And uh, I want to ask this question. And to us, it was like, oh, you want the blue legal block and the yellow one and the green one. And that's sort of what you do. And it evolves into this concept that we call the innovation space. And in the innovation space, there's a y-axis and an x-axis. And the y-axis is your methodologic expertise. You have smart statisticians in the room. They are adding new methodologic possibilities to what you can do. On your x-axis are your data types. The growth of that clinic and the growth of that enterprise from a little 50-person clinic in Alabama to a worldwide leader in several lines of research or a worldwide contributor maybe to several lines of research is the story of these data. It's a story of aggressively push, pushing the y act, the x axis and saying, let's add some different data elements to what we capture so that we have some different independent and dependent variables that nobody else has. So I have conversations with people all the time and I use this as a rubric. So people will tell me things like, I'm oh, sorry, Dr. Shah, did you? I would like to make a comment once you okay. take that pause, but not now. So, so, you are ready, you so people will, will come to me and they'll ask me a question like, hey, I'm really interested in the factors associated with 30-day readmission for heart failure. And immediately I sort to take a step back and I look at our institutional innovation space. And here's sort of a simplification of it. I've got, you know, these statistical methods, you know, proportional hazards, regression, odds ratios. I got a statistician that can do all these things for me. And these are some data elements that I have. And at some point in the conversation, I'll sort of blank out and I start seeing it this way. Okay, so what you want is demographic, laboratory, comorbidity, medication data. You want to use a logistic regression because you have a binary outcome at 30 days, and I'm going to have to look at admissions data for it. And then I say, I can draw it in the innovation space. Yes, we can do your research project. Let's get down to a data request form. And every one of your research projects, I bet you that if you were successful in getting them done here, I can map them to the innovation space of this institution. You run into trouble if you don't have the methodological expertise to do what you want to do, or if you don't have the data types to push what you want to do. But more importantly, this is the answer to how we, as a single site cohort, contribute, continue to contribute to the literature at large. This is the answer to that question. It's not the only answer, but this is the answer that we've chosen. One thing that Mogavero brought, he was the y-axis. Every day he would be pushing me and saying, but I think we should use these statistical methods. And I didn't understand 70% of the words that he was saying, but he would sort of insist on it. And I would just say, just give me the data request. Just give me the data request. I, I, I can do that. But he would push, and we would use the same data elements that we had in new and novel ways, bring in the methodology from other disciplines, and have great success. And at the same time, I was always on the lookout for what's the next data element that we can add. Because if we try to do convention things conventionally, and we try to say, well, here's 200 of our patients on new drug A. In a clinic with 3,000 patients, it's probably going to take us two, three years to collect 200 people with new drug A. But the world of HIV is such that there are several people that, with a couple of lines of code, can combine data from all continents. And they can find the answer to the same question with a sample size of 50, 100,000 people on new drug A. We're never, going to, we're never going to win the sample size fight. We will never get published that way. So the only way we remain relevant <coughs> is by pushing the envelope either along that y-axis with new methodology or along the x-axis by adding new data types, as you've seen here over time. And then what we publish, it takes them years to be able to reproduce because to get 500 clinics spread across five continents to all capture data the same way, good luck. You will accomplish that in five years. We can do that in months. And we can have these new data we can be. So our size, we started looking at it as an advantage. We started thinking that we're, cruise, we're, we're sort of speed boats. We can just turn on a dot. You know, we're going to collect this piece of data, whereas the other guys are cruise ships, and it's going to take them years to be able to collect that. So, again, you don't get into a pushing contest against a wall. We're not going to win the sample size fight, but we are going to win the other fight, and that's how we remain relevant and working uh, successfully. So now, you know, the 1970 clinic really is an international leader in several lines of research. We've looked upon the clinic as a research platform um, where any investigator can bring their idea and we run them through our processes and we can help them be successful in their research. 
and just point out that you know the growth of your data is tied to your research enterprise at every step of the way. Dr. Strat. Sorry for the pause. So I love hearing the story. Every time I learn something new, and every time I get even more excited, I want to run to the 1970s. <laughs> but honestly, it's just such a fascinating story. And the messages for old crew and new crew are so important. So hopefully, you're taking mental notes and sort of having some implant made in your brain. So, but, but the pause is, at the same time, I'm worried, well, not worried, but I want to see what Rakshay is going to think about this. She says, I want to survive. I want to match into pediatrics, and we have new people. This is just, mm -hmm. there's no way I can do this. So, and I want the people in the audience, new people, or peop older people, more experiences, what's in it for me? What can I do for this information? Because I can't do that. So, well, as you are listening, think about what are the things that you're taking away that will be applicable for you. Yeah. And I took already three things. Can I share? Please. Sorry. Yeah, great. So one is, I'm going to ask you for your student manual to do research with the 1970 data set, because I've seen other groups of researchers doing the same, and I have a mini, mini manual, and I want to make it better. So that's one takeaway for me. The second one is a message that is, if it's not loud and clear, please, you've been sleeping. Structure, structure, structure is critical. Whether it's the data format, with so structure and the format is critical for your own success when you write grants, papers, and so forth. So what does it mean? Well, make it applicable to your life. And the third thing is when you think about a data request form, this is to tap into your project, correct? Your data set. But everyone is doing some type of research, and everyone has to think about what you said. What are the data fields? Who has information? What is the dictionary? Is this clean or not? And so forth. So I think those are the three things. Data mining on data requires and data structure. But most importantly, how is that utilized and what do you say? That's good. I think we'll get it. We're going to. So I think. You know, here, one thing that, that we found is, and, and we've, we sort of joke that I think as sort of people with PhDs and, and degrees around that neighborhood, you're all kind of socialized for individual success. You've all sort of really focus on, you know, how can I take this agenda and how can I achieve this and I, I want to get to this bar. And that's great. But one of the other things that's kind of critical here is that when we met each other, you got to realize that when, Mogo, when I met Mogavero, I had several things that I was sort of working on, and I didn't know how to get them from there. I had no idea that those, they could be publications. And he looked at what I was doing, and he said, why haven't you written an abstract about it? Why isn't this? And literally, in, in the first month we met together, there was two abstracts that were submitted that were accepted. Next thing I know, I find myself standing beside him in some international age conference in Monaco. <laughs> she looks just kind of like, what am I doing here? This place looks like a postcard. Um, and then the next thing I know is he's sort of on me to say, but you have to put, and both of those things became first author manuscripts in, 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 a, in, in Clinical Infectious Disease, which is a, a sort of a flagship journal for, for Infectious Disease Society of America. But I had no idea that anything that I was doing could even have been considered for that. So I bring a lot of credit to Mug as sort of seeing the person, he's the person who sort of saw it. You know, in terms of this is where this goes, this is where the Y axis goes. He brought innovation on that Y axis and he said, what we're doing is important. It isn't just clinical care. You're not just tuning clinical processes. With these same data, you can also create research. So let's sort of take it in that direction. And I think what I brought was more the X axis, which is let's bring in these tools so that we can expand what we can do. Yeah, no, and just to tie in, I'm, and I think another point, Carlos, I would emphasize is partnership. If you could find and the peer partnership, and sometimes it's going to be at different levels, but the idea of bringing back kind of collaboration and everyone bleeds in data types. So James alluded to 99, the IDX system, which the UAB health system bought for administrative and billing purposes. It was not bought for research. It was an encounter-based system. We want to make sure we're tracking scheduled appointments, who attends, who doesn't attend, cancels, all for administration and billing. 
Um, for those that know me, my research, so it, it was used for that purpose, you know, administratively for seven years. My research has centered around adherence, but adherence to clinical care. So I'm very much relying on those encounter-based data to create metrics and do analyses. So when I first come back and thinking about that data, that, that axis, it's not just the element, but it's also access to the element and the facility and how you use it. So when I first came back and started doing studies, the process was we would have to do a query. I would have to get James's help. You know, here's the sample, here's the eligibility criteria, here's the IDX data we need, here's the fields we need, let's make the request, let's draw a date, we'll submit it through Dr. Raper to our IDX contact, they'll cut the data set, we'll get the data back, we'll do the analyses. And unbeknownst to me, and this is the idea of I think everybody bleeds, unbeknownst to me without me asking, I, I didn't even think about this, I, it wasn't even on my radar, behind the scenes, James sees we're gonna need these IDX data and it's very inefficient for us to keep doing cross-sectional query, cross-sectional query, cross-sectional query. So unbeknownst to me, he's starting, and it's, it's a month to year long process to work with the IDX folks to say, how do we get a direct feed of this data? So that I'm not having to go to your person to run the query, I've got my programmers, my data analysts to run the query, and then a few years later, that's available, all of a sudden, my potential as an investigator to ask questions, get those data back, and move them along, is exponential and the students working with us um, so and this idea of this is something that James didn't do for himself I mean James did this for me I mean this was something where he said this is going to benefit you this is going to benefit the larger platform um, so if you can find those trusted partners I think is such a critical part of this so again uh, this is James the innovation space is James I think it's really brilliant and to break it down and think about it and really think about the work we all do is really a brilliant way to think about things so this brings us to the risk, the Research Informatics Service Center. And so after a few years of doing this, um, you know, from the very beginning, I think James and I talked about um, why limit this to your, some of your points, Dr. Rashada, why limit this to HIV, to one chronic disease in a 3,000 patient clinic? Um, th these processes, these structures, these systems go more broadly. So kind of formed this service center and the idea of being outwardly facing and working with others, not just in HIV, but very much, we spent many half-day retreats with our larger team on this mission and came up with, you know, and everyone has a mission statement, but to enhance well-being, promote health equity for individuals and communities through the identification, development, implementation, dissemination of approaches that build upon the strengths of an interdisciplinary team with integrated informatics and research expertise. Previous versions of this had HIV. We don't want HIV. We're not only doing HIV. What we're doing is more broadly applicable. You know, James and his team in the, in the not just data space, but the software development space are now programming PROs for Brandon Roke, a pediatric neurosurgeon, for folks in gerontology and geriatrics, for folks in OBGYN, for folks in, in um, rheumatology. So the idea of these software, these tools, these processes, nothing about this is unique to HIV or this clinic. Um, and also kind of came together and said, at our core, our core values are around education and professional development. And those two things being different. The idea that education for our trainees, and we'll talk more about our staff, folks going on and getting master's degrees, doctoral degrees, uh, if they do it within our organization, great. If they outgrow us, even better. If we have folks that come and spend time with us and move on um, to get a, a nursing degree, you know, PhD, um, medical degree, dental degree, and we have all examples of those fantastic professional development saying for the folks in our shop, we have to help them acquire new skills that are gonna both give them satisfaction, but also make them more valuable to our team to do more. So in the space of, of informatics, a lot of stuff through Microsoft certification programs, we're gonna pay for that, we're gonna sponsor that, we want you to do that. As you expand your skill set, it makes you better, it makes you more valuable to yourself for your future career, but also to our team in the research space qualitative services, interviewing skills. We're gonna take someone that's had no experience, we're gonna teach you how to do this, how to do interviews, focus groups, those kind of things, as well as other areas. The idea of service, and I think services gets to the idea of everybody bleeds, that there's gotta be, even though we're faculty, we have these you know, uh, milestones from our division chiefs and department chairs and deans, that we believe that by spending some time providing service to others at the expense of my own advancement or James's advancement, the advancement of others is going to move the field forward and importantly move patients' health and wellness forward beyond if I'm sitting in my office by myself writing R01 after R01. And innovation, always needing to be in that innovation space. 
So James, I think you should talk about this because you really, I think, introduced me to this. And so this is this is sort of from a from a book from the Harvard Business Press called Keep Keeping Up with the Quants. And these guys have broken it down sort of three stages and six steps of quantitative analysis. And I think this really gets to um, a little bit of what the world will be like for you. I will tell you that your predecessors lived in the world where we all fought to get best of breed software or data entry tools for our specific research enterprise. So if I was a nurse manager on the unit and I wanted software to track my patients, I was going to fight for the best thing that was available. And if you were the person working in the ER looking for patient flow, you were going to fight to, for your organization to buy for you the best software that was available. What you end up is you end up with this fragmented environment like we have at UAB where there's over 200 data systems that are independent and don't speak to each other. So that innovation space, though we have all kinds of information, our innovation space is fractured. The real potential comes when you now you going forward. The question that you should ask is not you shouldn't be a best of breed mentality. You should be a best of integration mentality. How can I get your that this system? Does it tie into what I have? Does it expand my innovation space or is it some standalone island that's not really going to help me? So now in an integrated world, because the, the problem for a lot of your predecessors was how do I capture data? I'm going to get an R1 to fund this whole thing so that I can capture data for this research study. Now you're in a world where data are captured at every step. There's wearables, there's different things. How do I reuse the data that are already being captured? How do I design my processes within the process that already exist so that I can capture high quality data? Your problem is not a problem of capturing the data if you're clever. Your problem is more a problem of making sure that it's integrated and how do you extract it? And you're gonna need a big team for that. You're gonna need people with different skills in what you do, but it starts with you. You are the domain expert. You are the person who sees the gaps in the processes. And you say, you know, in this thing that I do here for a living, I think that there's a shortcoming there. I'm going to go see the literature to see what other people have done about it. And you're going to see a bunch of papers and you're going to say, people haven't quite figured this out. Then you're going to step to the solving the problem phase. And that's where you're going to need to work with people in informatics, with people that are statisticians, with people that know epidemiology and you're going to design your studies you're going to get data extraction you're even going to have to think about how can i alter what i do to collect the data needed to analyze this problem you're going to extract the data you're going to model you're going to analyze and you're, they're going to come up with some answers and then it goes back to you as a domain expert and now it's up to you to look at all of that to validate it to say you know this doesn't pass the smell test or let's 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 look at it this way um, but ultimately Yes, we've got the answer and answer here. We have a piece of the puzzle. And then how can you communicate and act on that result successfully? You're the domain expert. Is it presenting at such and such a conference? Is it publishing at such and such a journal? Is it making sure that the preliminary data for this is the preliminary data for your K award or your R1 that's coming up next? Again, this is how it works. You are the brackets of the process. The process exists within you, but you are in the age of team science where data capture is complex where data capture is thorny. There's a million little informatics things that can trip you up. But if you work with those folks, you will be able to get those data and accomplish great things. And remember that you drive the process as the brackets, but the process is bigger than what any one of us can do in 2017. So yeah, this is, you know, thinking about, look at this and the processes and what happened and what was put in place. And it was really fun, I think, preparing this because James and I have worked really closely together, have been on different paths, but have remained connected and, and working together and kind of different ways of summarizing and synthesizing, you know, the early period of working together. So looking at to the points about structure and processes and this cohort, this database, when you look at it between 2006, published about three manuscripts per year out of that database. And again, it tended to be the one person that was driving it. Stephanie Call wrote three papers. Ray Chen wrote three papers, maybe one with me as a student working with him. This idea of a platform for anyone and everyone to bring good ideas and concepts and get data and publish, you know, you grow to 16 manuscripts a year because now it's not one or two co-authors in the leading projects. You have multiple authors and people benefiting from co-authorship and real team science and interdisciplinary science. So large number of new grants and collaborators, many new data types added as you've seen and really continuing to challenge ourselves and push ourselves and our team. It's not James and I, we're here to talk about it. It's really the folks that we are, we're privileged to work with to really drive that innovation space. 
What are the new data elements? Where is the field going in that way? What is the new methodological expertise? How do we kind of keep pushing and driving and not remaining, you know, kind of we've gotten to this point. Um, how do we go to the next level? So put another way, looking at these six years. So the 1917 uh, clinic had a 25th anniversary uh, several years ago, five years ago, and put this together and looked back and said, wow. I mean, during this time period, James and Alfredo Guzman and Mohit Varshney and that team generated 1,500 analyzable data sets for 150 unique users. I mean, this is kind of the level of process that when the, the throughput. There were over 50 cohort papers and as well as 75 collaboration manuscripts. Again, this idea of not just the internal people, but people that were outside of the 1917 clinic proper using this platform and engine to do important research. And, and contributing to over $30 million in, in direct grants and contracts, as well as being able to have a number of ongoing studies. You see this ramp up of studies. We're actively not just using existing data, but using existing data to query for the behavioral intervention study. So I wanna know who's been non-adherent so I can do an intervention, target them through James's PRO and do an intervention for alcohol use, substance use, expert type models, this type of work. So all of a sudden we even transformed starting in 2013 where it's not just secondary analyses from this great database. We're now doing intervention studies, leveraging this resource to then identify and, and do this. And you know this has continued on where at any given time, we're coordinating between six to 10 active intervention trials within that one clinic of 3,000 patients um, and are able to do that by leveraging economies of scale of a team. We have two recruiters in the clinic. You don't have to hire your own recruiter. So this is kind of the kind of processes that you put in place that make it possible. As an educational platform, and for me, this has always been um, the proudest thing is the students that have come through and trainees that have come through. So this is over the six year period. And again, this has continued onwards, but the number of trainees that rotated through with us, both pre and post doc success. And again, I think, you know, one of the greatest compliments that I've received is from Jerome Allison, who many might know, who's a very seasoned investigator who, while he was here said, it is unheard of for a summer student to complete a first author paper. It is rare, you know, you're there for a summer, you have an experience. He said the frequency with which you guys are having success in having these students publish. And to your point, Carlos, this is because of a plan, a process, a structure, but also when we sat down with the student, we said, this is the expectation. This is not for everyone. It's not gonna just be your summer. When you're back in school, nights, weekends, scholarly activity, you know, but by setting that and giving that structure, but if you wanna do it, we're gonna back you up and you're gonna publish that paper. And when you go for your residency interview, you're gonna stand out and be distinguished. A lot of oral presentations, a lot of master's degrees, PhDs, this number has increased exponentially. Uh, summer medical students, scholarly activity students, and again, I think a real source of, of pride for us. Um, and this is what our team looked like in 2012. And I think part of what we wanted to point out was, um, so while proud of the success of all of those uh, trainees and traditional students, when we look at our team and we look through, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, a pointer for those, uh, he's the arrow, I guess. So here's Scott Beatty. Scott Beatty was working with us as a study coordinator. Scott Beatty got his PhD in social work at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, outgrew us and is now on the faculty in the School of Social Work. So the idea of valuing Scott's education, um, it's not just Scott, Melanie Walcott, PhD in Epi, Reedy Modi, PhD in Epi, Ashley is pursuing a PhD in health behavior. Stephanie Gaskin, master's degree. Aaron Fuller actually left us to go on to nursing school, is now practicing as a registered nurse in, in UAB uh, health system, um, and on and on. I mean, looking at folks on the team, um, and, and you kind of see this, this progression, and I think as much as we valued the academic currency, I mean, get it, it matters, you gotta publish, you gotta get grants, but when you're able to look at the, the trainees that come through, but also your staff and empowering these folks and supporting their education and saying, you know what, if you have classes twice a week, you can go to class twice. We'll work around your schedule because we want you to be successful and you're gonna give back to us by going and pursuing that degree. Um, so James, I think you gotta handle this one. <laughs> I think, you know, you're all, you're all sort of uh, hard on yourselves is why you're here. I think it's very important to be honest with yourself. And I think for us, you know, we sort of reached the point where, yeah, we can each go into our office and we'll have a career that'll span three or 400 papers and they will be gone. Or we can sort of work together with some of our time to create a platform that will allow for all this other growth and all these other people to have success. 
And I know the metrics that my division director wants me to meet. And I'm not saying don't meet those metrics. I'll meet those metrics, but I'll also do something that will be significant to us in a different way, allowing all these folks to achieve more than they would have alone. I think that's really meaningful to both of us. And when we see people come up to us and say, man, I've just been hired to be the head of analytics for this new unit at BBVA Compass Bank. And we, and we remember interviewing that guy who used to work for the cable company and came to us to be a data analyst. And now he's the head of an analyst. As we've transformed that life. You know, that we're not writing that in our CVs, but I tell you what, when I'm done, it's people like that that are going to really stick out in my head. All the people that we've sent to medical school, to nursing school, to dental school, these are lives that we've transformed. Not only with our students, who we can do the same thing with, their own faculty here, their own faculty there, they've gone on to match and proceed this training, but this is sort of what's, what's moved for us. So I think, you know, the moment of honesty for us was, yeah, we can kind of go with the traditional metrics and worry about ourselves, and frankly, worrying about ourselves is what got us both hired at UAB. But then at some point, we kind of said, wait a second, if we're able to collaborate, we can maybe do more. And that was, it's easy to say, but it was a hard transition. And it, it took me personally several years to really sort of feel that, feel those words and what they meant. Trust but verify, that's going back to trust yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When you take a picture of James? Huh? When you take that so I took that picture in a, in an IDSA in uh, San Francisco. I ran into this when, guy. When? Uh, this is a while back. This is probably more like 10 I years was, back. I was there two weeks ago, and I'm not sure if it's the same guy, but... <laughs> <laughs> I gave him 20 bucks. He doesn't change, and I gave him anything. He has yeah. <laughs> My life so sweet. Oh, really, he has. Well, you know, the world moves on. He's moving on that innovation space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, again, this is... Um, so I think this is a book that has been influential to both of us. It's a book called Start With Why by a gentleman called Simon Sinek. And there's a great, there's a there's a couple of YouTube things of his TED talk. There's like an 18 minute one, ignore it, go for the five minute one. It says the same thing in five minutes. Um, and I think it really talks about organizations and how we do things. And an example he gives in the book was he basically said, you remember how Dell used to make MP3 players? And everybody's like, no. <laughs> and Dell admitted no. But what happened, you know, at one point Dell said, hey, you know, what do we need to uh, do this quarter? Well, here's a hole in our pr uh, pro product offerings. So what should we do? Let's should make a MP3. How are we going to do it? Let's get a bunch of smart engineers in the room and tell them you have to make an MP3 player. And why? I don't know. Because we've got to put an MP3 in the market and we'll make some money. And I think that that's how I went through my education. At one point, said, you know, my father asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to be a video game designer. And he's, he smacked me. He said, no. <laughs> what are you going to do? I'm going to ask you again. So he convinced me that I wanted to be a physician. Threatened me slash convinced me. And I said, okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be a physician. How are you going to do it? I got to tell you, I spent a lot of years saying, what's the next test? What's the next board exam? What's the next bar? And that's sort of how I did it. And eventually I got on faculty. And here I was. And I realized that I had this great kind of vacuum because there was no next test. There was no next board exam. There was like, you're here, you know, what do you want to do? And it was very easy to coast for a while on, well, I'm helping all these people with all these data projects and all of that. And then an interesting thing happened to me, which is I, there was a, a friend of mine that I had really pushed to get this grant and, and, to, and he, he called me and he said that things were successful and he had published his first, first author paper. And he was ecstatic and he was talking and talking to me about it. And I was just so proud of him. And uh, eventually he asked, well, how about you? How's it going for you? How many, what things have you published this year? That was the year I published the most. I had published something like 16 papers and, and he stops and he just starts laughing at me, just starts laughing. And he said, James, you sound miserable. How can I be this happy about one paper? And you sound terrible about 16. Just, you need to check yourself. This is a terrible thing to hear because then I was forced to think instead of do. And over several months, I finally thought, I really don't know why the hell I'm here. I kind of got here. It took me about, you know, over a 15 years to get to where I was going. I'm board certified in these things. And I just don't particularly enjoy coming to work every day. And I think the problem with me was I had no why. And going back to Sinek, he would say, you know, why is there an apple? with Steve Jobs. He would say, we are here to use technology to challenge conventional thinking and turn business models on their head. 
And so they said, you know, why are we doing this? Well, you know what? We think music distribution sucks. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the entire model for music distribution. We're going to democratize the process. If you want one song off one album, you don't have to buy the album. You can buy just that one song. And then how are we going to do that? Uh, well, we're going to create this thing called the iTunes Music Store. We're going to have this new business model. And, and uh, we probably have to put, throw some technology in there. So they threw in the, the iPod. And they, we'll do this. But that's really sort of a vehicle for us to accomplish. What we want to do. And what did they do? They transformed the world and they upended all of those business models. So Sinek would say that people who have true and meaningful success start with why. Retroactively, I had to find my why because I was miserable. And every metric that I reported to my division director, I got a good boy. You're one of my best young ones. Keep fighting. And I felt miserable. So I really started thinking about why am I here? What gets me out of bed in the morning? And I summarize it in an equation. So X is your base skill. And X for me equals the number of lives that I can influence positively. So for me, my base skill is I'm an, inter an internist and an infectious disease guy. I can help. I, you know, I have right now, I have a patient in Massachusetts and a patient in Mexico and a patient in rural Alabama. And I'm on WhatsApp chats every night and reading and telling them what they should do with their treatment. Um, and I see people in my clinic and so forth. But there is a limit to how many people I can see 24 seven research and my, you know, my dealings with uh, Dr. Mugavero here, what he has taught me is that if I'm able to take what we find in research and we publish it, maybe mistakes that I'm making in my practice, other people don't need to make. And all of a sudden, I can exponentiate the impact of what I know. And I believe that. I've actually met people who have said, but I have read this thing you wrote. It's happened like twice in 14 years, <laughs> but it blows my mind. I can't believe somebody actually read this besides me. But people do read what you write. You'd be surprised. And they say, I changed this of what I do, or we did change this in the clinic because of what we published. Informatics, as you've seen, we've used informatics to really potentiate research, and we've used informatics to even potentiate clinical care processes. And then education, because the curious thing for me is that whenever I recognize a pattern of illness, I often remember the people who taught me that pattern. And it brings a smile to my face because it's not like I'm in that room. It's these people from you know, the 2000s and from the 90s who taught me how to recognize that pattern of disease that are seeing that person, you know, I'm, they, you know, they're the ones making the diagnosis through me. And it always cracks me up, but it underscores for me how important education is and how we want to have a, how I want to have a role in that. So when I figured out, I go to work every day because I'm a clinician that does these things because I believe in research, because I believe in informatics and I believe in education, all of a sudden, I re-looked at what I was doing, and I took 75% of research training that I had on my time, threw it off the bat, and chose a different direction of what I was going to do. And I've never been happy. I've spent seven years with a smile on my face, and things have gone well, things have gone poorly, but I'm doing what I believe in and what I'm passionate about. And that's why I think you should all consider your why. You shouldn't do it retroactively like I did it after 17 years of training. You should do this early on, and you should know why the heck you're coming here and what you're doing. Yeah, not. Well said. Um, so this is another depiction of this. Has anyone read this book? No, it's, it's a, I highly recommend. I mean, it's really a, a wonderful read about both, I think, self-reflection, but also thinking organizationally and, and kind of um, beyond yourself. So I think for me with, you know, um, similar type crossroads with James and, and said, you know, I'm doing all this work. You know, you're in the daily grind, just doing, 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 and you stop and say, why am I doing this? Why did I start doing this? What did I want to achieve? And I realized it was to impact health and wellness in people's lives and predominantly folks with HIV. So um, let's not stop with what am I doing every day or how am I doing it? Why am I doing this? And kind of made a conscious decision. And we'll say, it was at a point in my career academically where I had achieved enough milestones with a certain amount of grant funding to have some flexibility. So I think you know, being mindful of there are those milestones. This can't be you know, exclusive of you have to have certain metrics of success. Um, but could step back and say, you know, writing a bunch of papers, have some grants, but it's out of a clinic with 3,000 patients. There's all these folks around the state who are not in care, who are kind of falling out of care, who are going to my community partner agencies for help with, you know, um, food insecurity and housing and all these things. And we're not connected to each other. And how, how are we not communicating in public health? Like we all have these same clients and we're providing services, but we're not connected. So for me, you know, my kind of why moment wasn't as dramatic as James, but was, I'm gonna get out of the office. I'm gonna drive down to Montgomery, Alabama. I was there yesterday. 
every six to eight weeks, invite myself down to the Alabama Department of Public Health, I don't have an ask. I don't want a grant. I don't want data. I want to know what are you doing? What are your challenges? Here's what I know. Here's what I can do. Here's the people I work with. How can I work with you and partner with you to help you be more successful? Because I think our whys are aligned around this HIV prevention and treatment space. I did the same thing with community partners, community agencies, local health department, and you just keep showing up. At first, they're like, yep, yeah, you know, he'll come once, this happens, you know, you know, and you go without an ask, and they're like, okay, nice enough guy, you know, and they send you on your way. You just keep showing up and keep showing up, and it's, I don't want data. I don't, I wanna know, you know, here's why I'm doing this. Here's why I'm here, because I understand this is why you're here. How are we gonna work together? And it takes years and it takes a lot, a lot of people, I mean, to build community and engage community. But then for me, it ends up with, with moments like this, right? So in, in 2015 and 2016, here we are working with our community partners, our public health partners, convening frontline providers. So the disease and, uh, information specialists, the, the linkage coordinators, the folks that are doing the HIV work in the field coming together, many folks saying from the health department and Birmingham AIDS outreach, we've talked on the phone for 10 years. We've never met each other. I mean, and having that kind of interaction and communication. So for me, this was my embodiment of the why. And for three years, not a single thing came from it in terms of the academic currency. Gave me more pride and joy this, these two hours thinking about the last few years in terms of just feeling satisfaction than, than any other times that I could remember. Um, and then what happens ultimately is a new CDC grant comes out. They need someone to be the evaluator. You've kept showing up. You're the UAB CFAR, you've got some credentials. So a public health ADPH grant is now saying, we'll give you a subcontract to be the evaluator. We've got a new grant from the community agency. So not focusing on you know, what we do or how we do it, but why we do it. You know, and if you're earnest and, and you know, I, I think it trickles down and those kind of things happen. Um, so was, was gonna finish with, you know, again, just some of where, where James and I are going going forward. From the very beginning, when we first started talking, it was always the idea of a platform and an engine, but it was never exclusive to HIV. The vision was, if we're, we're doing this work in this one clinic with initially 1,200 patients, now 3,000 patients, why aren't we doing this throughout the health system? Why aren't we doing this in other chronic disease areas? And I think through the risk, through the services, we've been able to work with others in other areas but something we're gonna try to work on, and this is in its infancy, so poke holes in it, this is just you know, an idea and a vision of where we wanna go. Give Ryan Outman all the credit for the name, it's not set in stone, but I like it, that we wanna create the UAB score, a scientific community of outcomes and effectiveness researchers. And for me, a big catalyst for this thinking has been coming to this meeting and being inspired and motivated. Other than being in the community with those folks, Friday morning from eight to 9.30 for the last year and a half, has been my happy place and my happy time being here with folks, you know, in the T32 space, the K space. So, you know, now instead of retroactively finding my why, trying to more proactively say, why do we want to do this? Why? Because we want to cultivate a dynamic community of scholars who are steadfastly committed to optimizing wellness, enhancing engagement, achieving health equity for individuals, communities, and populations. Again, inspired by what I see you all doing as T32, as VAX, as K trainees, we're all here. We all go our separate ways, and some of us have little shops like we have in Risk, and there's another shop over here and here and here. But boy, if we were bumping into each other more, probably some good things would happen if we were actually spending more time in shared space doing those things. So this is why you do it, because you want to come together, you want to do this, you want to in improve individual, community, and population health. You know, how do you do it? Well, how? You got to focus on the centrality of training and professional development. You got to focus on the promotion of medical informatics. Um, uh, research synergies, integrate science, education, policy, connect dots across centers, divisions, departments, organizations, teams, and scholars, and team has got to be greater than the individual. So Lou Holtz, uh, together everyone achieves more. You've got to think team's got to come before. Everybody bleeds. It's another manifestation of this. But then what do you do? Can we create a co-located physical home? Can we get a space? I mean, no one's going to build us a building tomorrow, but you've been at places where you have these health services, research, informatic shops. Can you come together with a co-located space, have a brand, provide some of those essential core services around data management and software, regulatory compliance, design, biostats, analytics, partner with what the CCTS is doing, the core is doing, all these centers are doing, have these seminars, symposia, workshops, compete for mission-aligned grants, 
and celebrate our successes big and small. So just kind of to share a little bit about where we're hoping to go, where we're intending to go, where we're gonna be looking for guidance and partnership is the idea of can we do something on a bigger scale using all of the experiences we've had with the risk, but really the catalyst has been this space and these trainees uh, and working with you all um, to say, can we take this to scale and do something that's gonna be much more impactful, you know, not for UAB, but for the state of Alabama and the people that live here and their health and, and their wellness and prevention and, and treatment. So that was my, I think, last thing. And James, I think you had, you had the last word. Uh, right. <laughs> Uh, honestly, you've got to, if you, if you emanate from your why, when other opportunities come up to you, you'll be able to think back to what you're passionate about and you'll say, is this a good opportunity or a bad opportunity for me? You'll always struggle with that in your career. You're going to do good work. Different things are going to come your way. So basically, you know, when, once you're centered, you can say, you know, this actually is a great thing and it gives me a great platform to accomplish what I want, what I find important and what I want to put my uh, my cycles into while I'm in this institution. So yes, I'll do it. Or you can kind of look at it and say, yeah, this would be great, but it takes me away from what I really want to accomplish while I'm here. So it helps your decision making. It's also what you're going to do on nights and weekends because your jobs are hard. Your jobs are not nine to five. Your jobs will spill over into your personal life and you will struggle with that balance. But when you are passionate about something, when you're doing something that really comes from that core, that why, you'll be able to stay up that extra hour after you put your kids to sleep um, and you'll tinker with it a little bit and you will accomplish things because you'll you'll have started with that why um, don't forget that it's a business I think Dr. Strata said structure 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 in every part of this you need to think you need to always you need to be playing chess not checkers two or three moves ahead what's going to be the reuse of this data if I do this now it's going to produce multiple outputs if you put that additional time into design, you will have a better product at the end. And, you know, we would encourage you that institutions have institutional goals. This institution was here before us. This institution will be here after we're gone. You should never personalize things. The institution is going to go some direction. One of the saddest things is when I hear someone say, I gave this place the best years of my life and look at what's happening now. That to me says that you personalize it. You're bitter. It's not that. This institution has things that they want to achieve. Think about your objectives. Is there alignment? Great. Then do them. If there is an alignment, there are institutions in which your passions are aligned and you will find them. But don't personalize it. It's not about you and me. If you think about something greater and you're trying to achieve something greater by collaborating with each other, by doing things beyond just what you can do on your computer screen, I think you need to have that mindset. You know, Let's align our objectives. Let's achieve great things. And if at one point we're you know, not a lot anymore. That's okay. I am grateful for every day that I spent with you and for how much better each of you made me. Thank you. This was very motivational. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it makes me think of things that we wanted to do in the School of Nursing, like start a, a safety collaborative, not just for our school, but for the whole Alabama and then further to the southeast region and you know we're having trouble of course getting started because there's no there's nothing you know you have the 1917 clinic as a starting point we have nothing but two people who are interested in doing this how tell me where you got the resources from how did you go about building this when people are always telling you well, go, go write a grant for it. We don't have any money for that. Tell me how you did these things. I think we can we can both answer that question. I, I, uh, I will tell you that one of the most amazing things that I've seen happening for the last couple of years is in the nursing school. It's this yeah. thing, this solution studios thing. And the nursing school seems to have very much this not, let me look at my discipline, but how can I collaborate and do other things. So have you guys heard of solution studios? Are you familiar with it? No, so, I'm not, actually. So this is Nancy Wingo, um, sort of a driver with her. She's got some friends in engineering, and they get a bunch of nursing students who have seen some clinical time, and they come back saying, boy, but that catheter was a really awkward thing to put on that, on that male patient. And they go talk to a bunch of engineers and all these different people, and these people are thinking differently. And they're saying, well, why are you using those materials? They ask questions like, why are you using those materials? Or why, are you, why don't you use such and such a technology instead of this one? And a nursing student says, I don't really know what you're saying. 
but they sit down together and they put them in teams. And these guys have already produced, I think, like, they have two or three things that are going to be patented, and they've been doing this for about a year. Huh. And it is really just a bunch of students. So, again, I think you start small and you start measurable and you have success. And, and as you have those successes, you'll see that, you know, things will grow. And then you get to understand what the uh, uh, the great American philosopher Jalen Rose, one of the best <laughs> players from the Fad Five, loves to say, you never get what you deserve. You get what you have the leverage to negotiate. Mm -hmm. You but, make it important, you put it on the table, and then you tell your department chair, out the door, out the door, unless <laughs> things change. Yeah, no, I, I think, Pat, though, you know, to think, it's very well said, and James and I talked yesterday about, we had this incredible resource and platform to build from. If we had to build the database from the ground up in those things, it would have been much more challenging. Having said that, everything that we've done has been funded through grants, contracts, fee-for-service agreements. So neither of us has any background in business. I'm still not very good at business, but we've learned a lot about that over time in terms of starting small, having a first grant, but also things that we learned together was you know, data has value. It's taken us a long time to convince people the same way that it takes expertise to run whatever uh, assay at the bench. The, the level of education and training for a programmer to write the code to extract your data. So how do you operationalize some of these things? So it's been a process, and I think part of how we've funded it over time, one, it's been first one grant and then something else, but then very quickly. I mean, we went from it was the two of us and four informatics folks to this larger team. Um, and I think what we've learned, at least in the experience, is diversification is key. We didn't get any big infusion of funds from our division chief, department chair, dean. They like the grants, the indirects, the papers, you know, but this has been done through how are we going to grow? How are we going to support this person, whether it's in a grant, contract, fee-for-service agreement? And I think that the, the reality is it was small, um, but, but kind of grew over time and trying to look for opportunities where you might not think this is a, a source of funding yeah. and identifying funding streams that might not have traditionally thought of, here's a way to generate some revenue to help support something over here that we're really passionate about. I think aligning your objectives is also very important. Again, it's sort of spend that time in design. It's sort of saying, how do I create that intersection where everybody walks away having one? And I think it's, it's interesting because we really are, I'm going to the, it's, it's, I think there's a, there's some words in chaos theory for it that I can't remember right now, but it's sort of that I walk into a room and I don't want to win. You know, my, you know, you losing is not me winning. Mm -hmm. It's basically how do we align our objectives and we both get to the thing. And I think it has to do with a lot of how we walk into rooms now. We don't typically walk into rooms with an ask. We walk into rooms saying, hey, we're, we believe in what you're doing. How can we help? And the opportunities come from that. Um, and I think there's bills to pay, and we have to do a lot of business decisions, and how do we charge people reservers for that? None of that stuff goes away. But I think if, as long as you start small and you have success, you align yourself with your leadership, you understand what's important to your leadership and how they're going to win with those activities, then I think every step you take, eventually you'll see more people coming. Yeah, and, and I would add, I think it's been a, a different model, and and... As we've brought faculty to join us, it's been very open conversations about this is not a traditional model and system. You're not going to go and hire your coordinator, your RA, your data analyst. We are a team, and that, that diversification, it values. So I think in building the service center, um, it's not now six different faculty with their teams. It's six faculty that have shared interests and goals that have a shared group of people that we work with. We have very talented managers, you know, informatics director, finance admin director, research director. But part of that was also the idea of, as a faculty member, you know, I had a good run of grants. Boy, I've hit a cold spell. I got five people around me. Their areas become hot. You know, now I've built in through collaboration and partnership where I don't have to let go of my people because they can be redirected to work with others. So in terms of both the idea of, you know, stability of staff, kind of allowing folks to grow and mature, I think this system and model, um, and again, it's not for everyone, but this idea of a collaborative versus a, a group of individuals um, um, has been part of the success and part of the funding. And a lot of the funding comes outside of the, the six faculty. The majority of the funding is from folks in other schools, you know, departments, um, and even other institutions that leverage this engine, this platform. And we love that because that's you know, been the goal.
Um, I want to echo what Dr. Estrada and Dr. Patrician says. I always find this so inspiring when you guys talk about 1917. Um, but so one of the things coming from a clinical training background, et cetera, is informatics is just so overwhelming getting into research. Um, so, you know, one thing I was wondering is I recently found out about I2B2, and I'm wondering what that shared space is between risk and I2B2. Is that something so, that. Um, so I2B2 is just a. A way to format data. Mm -hmm. um, they sort of have this beautiful drawing where they have like a hive and you have like the cells in the hive. But it's basically if we all conform to this one data standard, then we can join all our cells mm -hmm. together and I can do a query at UAB and I can hit mm -hmm. I2B2 data in many other institutions. In fact, they've had this functional in the West Coast for many years, I think throughout the California system mm -hmm. and I think some of the other states as well, where you can do a query and look for people for this clinical trial and here you go. Um, I2B2 then, there's a lot of effort, we started, we participated in getting I2B2 off the ground, we literally like wrote a letter and begged money from Dean Vickers, uh, the Department of Medicine head, and the CCTS, and we said, um, hey, if you give us each a little bit of money, we're going to build this for you, and I know that you have this Institute of Informatics coming down in a year, I think we aligned the objective, the Institute of Informatics is in Dr. Estrada's grant, is in Dr. Estrada's domain. Um, but basically, we thought, if we can get this started now, you're getting real people that can do this coming down and do it. So again, this is an example of aligning your objective with the institution and being able to do something. Now, what I2B2 has become is they spend a lot of time looking at data from the health system at large from impact, and they put it into the I2B2 data format, and then any of us through the Blazor ID can just start querying it simply. How many people have heard about I2B2? Okay. How many people have heard about Tableau? Mm -hmm. How many people have heard about Vinci and the VA? Right. So, so the idea is whatever resources you have at your place, I take that as sandboxes. I love to dive into I2B2. I mean, not me. I would love someone to dive into I2B2 because there is, there is a richness data integrity and so forth. I'm more familiar with Vinci at the VA, but if you have an affiliation with the VA, Vinci is just set and prime to play in that sandbox that has nothing to do with these other conditions, there is a structure, and it took like 10 years in the making. Uh, so I2B2, this. Uh, how many of you have heard about Matt Might? Ben Might. Ben Might. Matt Might. Yeah. 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 Okay. Matt Might is the new director of who happens to be my division too. <laughs> so they need an appointment somewhere, correct? <laughs> who happens to be the new director of the personalized medicine institute, the call genomics, this and that. He's a PhD, but he's sort of hooked by the hip with the VA Million Veterans Program data set that is a nationwide, he was one of the architects from that. So bottom line is there are different sandboxes and sometimes I get personally overwhelmed, which one should I choose? I would say find your sort of your why, your passion, who is playing on that and go ahead and match. Yeah. If this is the best database because I think early on trying to decide should I do this or this or that, I personally I think it's too much information. But leverage yeah, and, and hoping, you know, I think part of the aspiration, and again, it's, right now it's just a, a, an idea and a vision that has to come operationalized, but part of this larger score idea is not that we all want to gain individual facility with using I2B2, but if there are some centralized people with expertise, the same way there's expertise where we have multiple data analysts that can query Power Insight and these multiple databases and extract them, is there an opportunity to kind of create that type of expertise to make data more accessible? Not just so I figured out myself, you figured out, we all figure it out. Um, to do something like that and centralize it takes some upfront investment and then takes that kind of shared trust and, and collaboration that once I get grants, I'm going to be putting in FTE or fee for service. So I think part of, again, I just shared this nascent vision for this score because. I think part of the idea is not all of us want to interface with I2B2 or you know any of these systems. Is there an opportunity to, again, very small scale, one clinic, 3,000 patients,
But the idea of having data analysts that understand how to interface with the system to extract data, is that a powerful tool, not just for HIV, but for whatever disease area? And if it is, can we build that and grow that and create this community that serves all of us or whoever's you know on board? Remember that figure, right? You're the brackets. You, as a domain expert, you find the gaps in the knowledge, and you're the one who's going to present the data and act on it. But that middle part, you know, knowing that this and I2B, now, we're people who use I2B, or we use Power Answer, or we use all the things that Dr. Estrada says. We don't, that we create software to capture other things, and we endeavor to feed those data into these systems, to, into these innovation spaces to disseminate them. But your concern should not be necessarily to understand I2B to you. You're perfectly consistent with having a conversation with someone like Dr. Estrada says and said, hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm all about. Which one of these things do you think or your experience could really help with that? And then you test it, and when you find one, you know, you stick with it, and you get partners that let them write the code. You do what you're the best at. I agree. I can accept, like, because it is overwhelming, especially in the VA. You've got all these, everyone wants VA data, and it's just super overwhelming. I'm a pharmacist, so I know pharmacy things, but I've learned that you're not expected to be an expert in every field. Like, I will never be a data analyst. I don't really want to be, it's too tough. But I've learned that starting like with Vinci and the VA has kind of brought me to knowing a little bit about that. Like I can't really use it, but knowing how about CDW, all these different things, fail, it's linked me to a lot of different opportunities, just having a working knowledge. Um, so that really kind of helped for me. We, we talked about like when we talk to a statistician, I probably even now don't understand 70% of the words that the statistician is using. But I can communicate it just enough so that he knows how to produce some analysis that I can go from there. But I will, you know, I got the MSPH and at one point I could even write some lines of SAS code. Those days are a decade behind me now. Uh, you know, and, and I really sort of have to depend on my statisticians to sort of get those things accomplished. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, so next week, uh, Dr. Tanak Wood will be joining us, presenting remotely from Tulane. We'll be talking about mentoring. So uh, we'll see everyone again next week. Have a good weekend. Our best person will be next week.